Nana Akufo Addo today addressed the nation on the evening informing us of the first two cases of coronavirus. But don't worry. When the university called me, I told them that you could teach your class online. <laughs> Get ready, son, to go virtual. The symbol of Kwanzaa is the seven candles. Hating everything that blacks stand for. Miles, stop! Every problem we face, every challenge we encounter, we have it within ourselves to solve it. And what we have to realize is that we are our own liberators. That a people that cannot save itself is lost forever. That no matter how numerous or sincere our allies are, those of us who would be free must strike the first, the final, and decisive blow. Take also that we have to support our institution of speaking truth for us, speaking truth to the people, speaking truth to the power, and speaking truth to the world. And we have to support that. And we also have to lay the basis for building a national campaign to sustain and preserve and strengthen black every city in this country. Because again, it is our voice, and for it to go is to silence us, and we will not be silenced or, si uh, or sidelined. And therefore, I say to us wake up, raise up, and reclaim our share. What power do they have? The power, they, they have the power to speak truth to us as a people, to get the information and share it, to bring dialogue, vital dialogue we need around interests, our own interests around issues that affect our destiny and daily lives. They have the power to represent us and what we think is right in the world. They have the power to uh, put forth and foreground black social justice tradition of speaking truth, of honoring our elders and our ancestors, of cherishing and challenging our children, of doing and demanding justice, of having a rightful relationship with the environment, caring for the vulnerable, resisting evil and injustice and always raising up, praising and pursuing the good. They have the power to do that and we must support that as a vital institution for our community. Celebrate Kwanzaa to celebrate ourselves. Kwanzaa is a celebration of family, community and culture. It is to raise us up, to speak our special cultural truth in a multicultural world, to demonstrate the best of what it means to be African and human by teaching fundamental values by which we understand ourselves and assert ourselves in the world and speak a beautiful truth to the world about ourselves. And of course the core, the hub and hinge on which the holiday turns are the seven principles, the Nguzo Saba, and they are Umoja, unity, Kujichagulia, self-determination. Ujima, collective work and responsibility. Ujamaa, cooperative economic. Nia, purpose. Kuumba, creativity. And Imani, faith. Faith in ourselves, black people. Faith in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. Hi, this is Alan Shea with Art Society Show, and we are here with an incredible uh, gentleman who's very inspiring and he certainly has captured Los Angeles in a way that probably very few people know of and I'm going to bring him in he's going to introduce himself and give you a little bit of his background so you can see really the significant of a man of this nature character and commitment hello everyone Ben Guillory I'm producing artistic director of the Roby Theater Company. We're in Los Angeles, and we're 27 years old. The Roby Theater Company has been part of the Los Angeles theater community for actually going on 28 years now. Roby was Paul Robeson's nickname, and he's the inspiration for the theater company. It was his social consciousness that inspired uh, the co-founder and myself, Danny Glover and myself, to found the Roby Theater Company because when, well, not when we came to Los Angeles, but 
We always saw there was a need for a theater of color, a black theater company. Why? Eh, here's an example. When I first came to Los Angeles, there were over 200 theaters in Los Angeles. There were about a dozen Latino theater companies. There were two Asian American theater companies. There is now a Native American theater company in Gene Autry's complex, but then there was no Native American theater company. Uh, there are, of course, East West Players, which is the oldest theater of color in the United States, going on 60 years old. Uh, it's in Little Tokyo, and I'm happy to say we've done some collaborations with the East West Players. But the point being that most of the theater companies, most of those 200 theater companies, were Eurocentric theater companies. They were white. And, eh, you know, theater companies are founded by people who have a specific vision. They have a specific story they want to tell most of the time. And so those Eurocentric theater companies back then, not too interested in telling stories about us or, for that matter, any people of color, mostly back then. It's changed, but... I don't know if it's for the right reasons, um, but it has changed. And when uh, Danny and I were old friends, uh, we knew each other before we were actors. And so when we did work together in San Francisco, we discovered that there wasn't a lot of work for artists of color, those who had been trained. I, I spent five seasons at the American Conservatory Theater Training and part of the company up there. And, and so did Danny. And when we put our heads together to find work, to do work, to try to discover the kind of work that we wanted to do, which was socially conscious work, it was very difficult. It was very difficult. And so fast forward a few years, our careers develop in film and television and in theater, We're still doing regional theater, and uh, relocated here to Los Angeles. It was time, we thought, to found a theater company that the focus, the sensibility was about us. W.E.B. Du Bois said theater should be by us, for us, about us, and by us, yes. So that's what we're doing. Wow. Well, let me let me chime into it because you know, as I was listening to you, Ben, your your story of the purpose of the Robles Theater is crucial, especially in today's climate. Mm. Uh, but the thing that I think the viewers would be interested in is. When did you discover that you had a love and, and a passion and a commitment for the theater and acting? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and why don't you share with them just a little bit the, the time period and the difficulties and the, and the barriers that existed at that time? Uh, you want me to do this? Okay. Um, I was always a fan, like just about everybody else that watched television, went to the movies and all of that. Uh, given I got a few miles on me, you know, it goes far back, right? Uh, and the performing arts always was appealing. And I was invited at one point to do some improv work. And I was bitten and smitten by the creative process and how it works and how stories are conceived, how the work process happens, the developmental process happens in from the page to the stage. And I liked it. I liked it. And I thought I could do this. And after some, well, trial and error, uh, things developed. I was admitted into this conservatory, and <laughs> they they were looking for somebody of color 
because they had no one of color. You understand? This was in the 70s. And this was before what is known now as colorblind casting or non-traditional casting, which is, uh, that's a whole nother story. But they were looking. And so they had uh, gave me a scholarship and it worked out. It was a place to learn. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about theater there at the um, ACT. And a, a passion grew because it looked like something that I could do really for the rest of my life in the sense that it wasn't a job you know it was a vocation it was something that had substance to it at least if you made the right choices in the kind of work one wants to do and the kind of work I wanted to do was the kind of work we're doing and uh, it's you know it, it's Our stories as people of color have been shortchanged for decades, actually for centuries. The opportunity to tell our stories from our point of view, through our own sensibilities, with a perspective that comes from us, is paramount. What has happened so much in the past, of course, not so much now, although mm, mm, you have to be careful. What has happened in the past is that the story has been told by someone else, usually white people who, up until a little while ago, and in some cases still now, are putting those stereotypes out there that are just that, you know, stereotypes. And it's all, it's, it's, it's absurd. It's really absurd. We wanted to tell stories that had a, a real substance to them. Again, part of what we do is train artists and technicians. We have at the Roby Theater Company a, an advanced scene study workshop where we work with actors on scene work and a playwrights laboratory where a, a playwrights are developed and uh, hone their skills, work on their own specific projects. For instance, now we've commissioned seven playwrights to write plays. One, Levy Lee Simon, who we've been working with for, well, the past 20 years. The next play that we mount, entitled uh, A Heated Discussion, opens after two years of being closed because of COVID. We open April 9th there at the Los Angeles Theater Center. And it's an, an original play. It'll be a world premiere. Five of the other playwrights are working on commissioned pieces that will be part of the Paul Robeson Theater Festi Festival mid-2022. And uh, Kwanzaa, A Celebration of Unity, is the play that we've been working on in the past few weeks. That'll stream come... December 26th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 30th, 31st through January 1, which are the traditional days of celebration of Kwanzaa. And so what, with that being said, because, mm -hmm. you know, I can sit here and just uh, follow you for the next five years to get all this information. I believe that it's real imperative so the viewers can can get a good understanding of one, if you could just touch upon uh, some of the roadblocks that mm -hmm. Robeson mm -hmm. Theater has had, mm -hmm. so viewers can be very much in tune with the commitment that you've made. So I'd, I'd like for you to share that. And then we will get into really a project that we want the viewers to receive uh, in open arms, and we can develop how that came about with the importance of what that project is all about. Roadblocks, funding, roadblocks, funding, roadblocks, funding. To find the resources to do the kind of work at the level that we want to do it, that we're capable of doing it, 
is a constant struggle, and it's not unique to just the Roby Theater Company. Theaters in general, no matter what their ethnic persuasion, they're all struggling to find the resources to do this kind of work, to mount plays, to meet the budgets, to find the operating costs, to keep the overhead going, to keep the doors open, to pay the rent, and all the rest of it that goes with operating, quote, a business. And there's public funding and there is private funding, individual funders, all of that, that after 27 years, we've developed relationships with. But at first, we were new in town, and there were those kinds of obstacles because until you develop relationships with public funding, which is out there, and uh, those resources, well, you're limited limited. So we started out as a reader's theater, reading plays, simply reading plays, not producing them, but reading them for two years until um, we found some of the resources. And of course, well, you have somebody uh, like Danny Glover, who's a bona fide movie star now, um, supporting you. That made a huge difference. The work itself, the kind of work we do, Here's a, a, an illustration. When I first came to Los Angeles, there was one black theater company in town. It was the uh, Inglewood Players over in, in uh, um, yeah, in, in, in Inglewood. And they were basically a kind of community theaters. They were passionate people, wonderful stories they wanted to tell, talented people, but they had not really been trained as administrators because this was part of the problem. I'm jumping back a little bit here. In the early 70s, when the movement, the movement was thriving, happening, there was funding for us because of the movement and because of fear, because of fear. And there were over 300 black theaters in the United States. That was 1971, 72. By 1974, there were something like maybe 110. Why? Because many of those theater administrators who founded the theaters were not administrators. They weren't trained administrators. They were artists. And did not have the wherewithal to sustain administratively a theater. And all that it takes to do year to year, season to season, uh, and raise budgets and to continue, which meant that they, turn, they came and went. They came and went. So many theaters came, came under the category of whatever happened to that theater over there that was doing that good work. They did two or three good plays, and but what, they're not there anymore because they folded, because of those reasons. And so I took a lesson from that, that we needed to put our infrastructure in place. That has been one of the obstacles. That has been a huge obstacle to sustain and infrastructure, the operating facility that allows for one to write, develop, and put the play on stage, not to mention to garner an audience, to find the audience, and so they'll come, buy a ticket, so that you can do it again. This takes time, and that's why there's such a turnover, I think, in small, what's called black box theater here in Los Angeles. The work itself, the kind of plays we want to tell, the kind of stories that we want to tell, that we have been telling, that are, our mission statement is to develop and to produce 
plays about the global black experience and to reinterpret black classics. That is the Roby Theater Company mission statement. Develop new plays, interpret black classics. Developing new plays through our Playwrights Lab has become something that is working. But it took us 15 years to really make that work and to let the artists of color who are, were, had a notion that they wanted to be a playwright, they had a story to tell, didn't know really how to tell it, didn't have a place to go that would match their sensibility in the storytelling, making that sensibility, those stories, a priority as opposed to a kind of afterthought or token which was what was happening to a large extent in, in, in the theater communities across the nation, actually. We have a lot of stories to tell because God knows, you know, the people who write history, you know, they, they tell that story. And, you know, an awful lot gets left out. Speaking, uh, of, speaking of that, Ben, because this, like I said, this is an incredible journey that that you're sharing with us and the viewers uh, because it is so enlightening uh, because a lot of people wouldn't think think about the difficulties in, in the trials and tribulations. I was wondering if you can shed some light uh, really on how important is the Roby Theater and its contribution for actors in theater mm -hmm. versus movies and, and really what type of source is it for the Los Angeles community? As a training ground, it's uh, extremely, I think, important. You know, this is unlike anything else. We're in Hollywood, Los Angeles, and artists come here usually to work in the television and film industry. They come to build careers there. They might have come from the theater, they might have been trained in the theater, they might have been weaned in theater, they may have a passion for theater, but they come to Los Angeles to do television and film. Why? Because they want to, because they can build a career there, because they can hopefully, possibly make a living there. Very difficult to make a living in theater. Very, extremely difficult to make a living in theater. One can work in the theater for minimal, minimal uh, financial return. And that's why, well, one has to really have a passion and want it, want it, need it, has to have it. The Roby Theater Company provides a place to develop that passion for those who really want and are, have a notion about theater. The other part of that is that the principles of performing artists, performance, the rehearsal process, just becoming an actor, a performing artist, or a playwright, or a technician, or a designer. One has to do it. You can do academia, and there's a place for that. It works, but there is nothing like actually executing, developing a piece of work from an idea to the page, to the workshop process, to the rehearsal process, and then to the performance, and offering that up to our community. That's the other part. Reaching out to our community, letting them know that we are here and we mean to stay here come and support us, and they do, because our community is starving, hungry for it, hungry for the kind of stories that we choose to tell. For the Love of Freedom was a piece of work that we did 2001, 2002, and 2004, a trilogy of plays about the Haitian slave revolt of 1793, about Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Desalines, and Henri Christophe. These were the trio 
of slaves, ex-slaves, enslaved men who rose and led the Haitian Revolution, the only successful slave revolution, black or white, that ended up in a republic, which Haiti is still a republic. Haiti is in bad shape today. But there's, that's a whole nother story. And that's not by accident, by the way. That is not an accident that it is in the turmoil that it. Anyway, we did that piece of work. Levy Lee Simon had written it as his dissertation out of Iowa uh, University. And he sent it to me and I recognize it. It is exactly the kind of work that we were founded to do. Part one was about Toussaint Louverture, part two was about Dessalines, and part three was about Henri Christophe. These men were tremendous revolutionaries. They won. They fought the French. They fought the Spanish. They fought the English. They fought each other, and they won. And boy, was this country real shaky about that. Because we're talking 1800s, early 1800s, from uh, 1793 through, through to about 1820 is when Christophe died. And this country was looking at Haiti saying, look, those Negroes down there, huh, we better watch out because we got, this might be catchy. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they were selling, the United States was selling guns to the English, the Spanish, the French, and to the Haitian revolutionaries. Does that sound familiar? That were being pointed, <laughs> again, you know, it, it just is the stuff of theater, but it actually happened. It, we've done works by Charles Gondon, No Place to Be Somebody, Lorraine Hansberry, of course. Uh, the play that we're streaming now for these last two years because of COVID, we've, like the entire theater community in the country, has shut down because of COVID and social distance and all, everything that you know about. So next year, April 9th, we will reopen with a play entitled A Heated Discussion. And it is a play that has been in development, has been uh, commissioned by Levy Lee Simon, to, uh, by, uh, by Roby Theater Company, uh, and the playwright Levy Lee Simon is writing it once again. We've had a, a wonderful, long, long, ongoing relationship with Lee, and he's such a talented playwright. He's actually gifted, I think. And uh, he's written this play, the premise being, Oshiras, African deities, have summoned spirits that have passed on iconic black figures, everyone from Martin Luther King to Malcolm to Lorraine Hansberry to Nina Simone to Pak Shakur to uh, uh, Julio Davis. This is Alan Shea signing out from Our Society Show, thanking you for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you.